Welcome to the Teamwork Advantage podcast with Greg Gregory. Join us as Greg interviews powerful thought leaders and successful team and leadership experts from across the country on teamwork, leadership, and organizational culture. Now let's check in for this week's episode. Welcome to the Teamwork Advantage, a podcast dedicated to the health, development, and growth of three things, teamwork, leadership, and culture. Hi, I'm Greg Gregory, founder of the Teamwork Advantage and your host. And we bring people to, with you each a week that help you outline those ideas with implementable strategies that you can use right away. And today we're gonna to take it in a slightly different turn, but not necessarily. So we have with us today, Eliz Green, and she's all about stress. Yeah, I, I said that right. She's all about stress. Some of you are probably going, what, what, huh? Yeah, that's one of my thoughts too, exactly. But I want to tell you just a little bit about Eliz. She's an author, blogger, and professional speaker who's ridiculously excited about stress. We'll find out about that as we go along. She not only finds the chemical reaction in the body caused by stress fascinating, and yes, there is a chemical reaction in our brain, she knows protecting your heart from stress isn't just nice to have, it's must have. And that's the key factors. Her latest book, Stress Proof Your Life, offers implementable strategies to combat uncertainty, overcome that feeling of being overwhelmed, improve performance, and of course, quality of life both at work and at home. She, treat, she treats stress management as a hard skill, essential to feeling better, protecting your health, and getting more important stuff done. And wow, wouldn't we all like to be able to do more of that? Hi, Liz, welcome. You're from uh, Wisconsin, right? I am from Wisconsin in yeah. the Milwaukee area. So welcome to the Teamwork Advantage. We're excited to have you here. Um, to get things started, I'd like to go back and say, okay, tell us a little bit what got you here and was there a defining moment that got you excited about stress? Well, we'd have to go back in the way back machine, uh, back about 21 years okay. uh, and a few months to find me seven months pregnant with twins. And I, at that time, was a dance teacher and a choreographer, happily married to my wonderful husband for 10 years. We'd be, been having uh, struggles having a family, but here, finally, we uh, found out I was pregnant, not only pregnant, it's twins. It had not been an easy pregnancy. And at that point, at, seven, at six months, I went into the hospital on bed rest was there for a month. And then on a faithful day, November 12, 2000, um, I had a massive heart attack while I was there in the hospital. And you asked for a defining moment. That is a defining moment. Now, uh, if you're listening to this on a podcast, you can't see Greg's face. There was a little bit of concern there. I'm well, my daughters are 21 years old. They are well. But it was this moment in time where there was clarity for me. I survived this massive heart attack. I was in the right place at the right time because I got great medical care right away. They were able to figure out what was going on, deliver the girls by C-section, and then uh, perform open heart surgery. I had a triple bypass to fix what was wrong with my heart. So I came out of that with beautiful two-month premature babies. Um, a fairly substantial recovery to endure and the knowledge that I had been given this gift of this weird story for a reason. And from that time on, I really felt compelled to share this wackadoodle story to inspire other people to pay attention to their health. And that started my career as an author and as a speaker really focused on women and heart disease. And back in the day, even doctors didn't think heart disease was something that was a woman's problem. It was really thought of as a man's okay. problem. So I did a lot of work with the American Heart Association, developed a program to really educate women and physicians about what happens to a woman and how to 
recognize the signs that women are in distress and that sort of thing, had to do a lot of research to make sure that the things that I were saying Mm -hmm. were backed up, medically relevant, and not some sort of woo-woo nonsense. (laughs) Then as we went along, I started to get requests to speak or write about work-life balance. And I didn't have the same sort of steeped in research information to share with people. I could, you know, do my best and and bring some things to the table, but I never felt as solid in there. So I embarked on a job stress study to really look at what does work-life balance look like? So if we could really figure out what that meant, we could develop develop a solution to solve that. But what turned out, because if you want to look at work-life balance and particularly for women, you have to have a very large data set. So I ended up surveying 4,000 people in all kinds of different jobs, men, women, everybody to get the right amount of data. But it turned out work-life balance for almost everyone was not the top stressor. It was overwhelm and uncertainty. And that... Let me, let, me, let me stop you for a second here. Yeah. Because it's being overwhelmed, mm-hmm. or is it the feeling of being overwhelmed? It is or things both. like... It's things like the number of things that you need to do in a given period of time or the pace at work or the uh, expectation of accuracy or productivity when your staffing is lower or the other factors that impede you. It's that kind of overwhelm. Okay. Um, so that's how we looked at it. And then uncertainty could be anything from, am I gonna have my job tomorrow? Or you know, is this uh, government decision going to impact what I'm doing right now? So yeah. all kinds of different things. And you know, not to mention, no, we've been in this weird world for two years. That's a lot of <laughs> uncertainty. Well, exactly. As well. And the stock market is exactly a perfect example mm-hmm. there. When the pandemic hit, the stock market just tanked for weeks. Mm-hmm. Because not because of something happening, right? But it was the uncertainty of something exactly. happening. Exactly. So our bodies react a lot the same way, if I understand you correctly. Absolutely right. Anytime there's a stressor in our environment, our body reacts to it. It has this very natural chemical reaction, as you said, when you're Mm -hmm. introducing me, that just happens. So let's pretend we're driving down the road on a highway and you're hanging out in the the right lane because you're going to take the, not this exit, but the exit that's coming up next. And there's lots of traffic to your left. And all of a sudden you see somebody coming down the on-ramp and they're not paying attention and they're not going the right speed and you're making your internal calculation that this is going to turn out to be a bad thing and you look to your left and there's a big old semi right there and you can't get over, Mm -hmm. that's a stressor. Cortisol, the hormone that naturally is produced by your body by in reaction to that stress, floods your body and all kinds of things happen. Your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up, your blood even gets stickier so that if you were in that car accident, you probably wouldn't bleed to death. All good things. Your reaction time gets faster. You're hyper focused on the problem ahead of you. But then when that semi speeds up a little bit and you can get over and you avoid the accident, that cortisol level goes down. It releases out of your body. Everything turns back to normal. And that's how it's supposed to go. It's goes up when you need it, comes down when you don't. The problem is when we live our life at that sort of high alert all of the time because we're overwhelmed or we're dealing with a lot of uncertainty, that cortisol level never gets to come down. And that's when it impacts our heart health, our general health, and our ability to think creatively and critically. So I'm assuming that also then impacts sleep. (laughs) <laughs> yes, absolutely it does. When our cortisol is high, it is very difficult for us to get to sleep. So when you're laying there and mulling things over in your brain and you can't go to sleep or you wake up and then you can't get back to sleep because you can't shut that off, that is cortisol being me. 
Okay. It's not good or bad. It's natural, it's but it can have some really difficult results. So that makes me think, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, but they always tell you, don't be playing around, you know, with these little things right here <laughs> right. for bedtime. I'm assuming right. that, that what that's doing is your brain is getting hyper-focused on something, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, social media, or right. just whatever. And you're just so hyper-focused that the cortisol levels are high mm -hmm. and you go to bed and you can't go to sleep. Absolutely true. And one of the things that is fascinating about our brains is whether or not we give our brain permission, it is constantly looking for problems to solve. That's, that's just how it works. So if you're scrolling through Facebook and even though you're like, I'm just casually scrolling through, if somebody brings up a topic you have an opinion about, your brain is engaged. So you're absolutely right. I truly believe if you want to go to sleep, if you want that cortisol level to come down, sleep is the most efficient way to get cortisol out of your body, but you have to get it down to a level <laughs> that will allow you to that go to you sleep can fall first. Asleep. Right. Mm -hmm. We can actively do things to disengage from the source of stress so that we can allow that cortisol to come down. And there's ways to tell your body to knock it off, let it go. Okay. I hope you're going to share some of those. I would be happy to share some of them <laughs> with you. So, and it's, By the way, just so everybody knows, uh, she's hitting on topics that are near and dear to my heart right now. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get Greg some more sleep. <laughs> I don't do bad on the sleep. I do okay there, but it's just the other stressors. So let's right. talk about that. So, So a lot of the time, we think about stress management in two ways. The same thing works for everybody. It's a one size fits all thing. And two, that it's a soft skill. Like it's this thing over here, it's soft. Like, you know, just be at peace with your stress. Uh, I don't look at it that way. I look at stress management as a hard skill. There are things that you can actively do to first disengage from what's causing you stress. And second, tell your body to let go of the cortisol. So let's talk about the letting go of, or the disconnecting from what's causing you stress. If I have your permission, I'd like to tell a short story oh, about how I came up with this. My husband is an attorney, would be described as a type A person. Mm -hmm. He is also a huge fan of very active activities while we're on vacation. And he's a scuba diver. I am not a scuba diver. My cardiologist would not allow me to do that. That seems like a poor idea. So for his 50th birthday, the special thing that we did is to go on a scuba trip down to Mexico with a couple of other couples who do dive. So he had people to dive with. That's more fun. They would go out in the morning, do the scuba diving thing, come back, we'd have lunch. And then we'd all go to the pool, which was in a mangrove with actual iguanas running around. And the other couples really enjoyed the pool. Mm -hmm. They would lie in the sun, read a book, have a beverage, you know, just enjoying basking in the sun with the iguanas so much that we started to refer to them as the iguanas. Now, my husband can't sit still and I am very pale. So hanging out at the pool is only going to be good for so long. So we would go do Umbrella's an activity. Work. Yeah, well, right. For, for so long. Yeah, but you know, um, so we'd go sightseeing, we'd go sail the little boat, we'd go swimming, we'd do something, and then we'd come back and socialize with my friends, and we were in and out. Mm -hmm. Until one day, one of the gentlemen said to my husband, when are you going to relax? You are go, go, go all of the time. And my husband said, I am relaxed. I'm like a border collie. If I don't have something to do, I start chewing on things. And it was one of those moments in a marriage where you're like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Now he's not like chewing on the furniture. Right, he no. just can't let go, right? He's in his brain. He can't let go about what's in his inbox or whether the project that he delegated is gonna get done. Like he can't let go of that unless he's occupied mm -hmm. and distracted. That's how he lets go of what's causing him stress. He's a border collie. I tend a little more to the iguana 
time. I like to read my book. I do like to sit. Maybe not in direct sun, but under the umbrella would be nice. So it's really understanding what you need Mm -hmm. to disconnect and giving yourself permission to do those activities so you can disengage from what's causing you stress and allow your body to recover. Now, for my husband, a lot of that are physically active. It doesn't necessarily have to be physically active. It could be mentally active. There's lots of people where, you know, just puzzles or things that really require concentration need, you need that occupation, that distraction. Other people need that quiet contemplative time. So you could be somebody who really loves to meditate in that quiet contemplative time. If you make a border collie, like my husband sits still and listen to his breathing, it actually makes him more stressed. So figuring out what you need is important. Then you can practice some things to tell your body to let go of the cortisol. Anytime your heart rate goes up, you keep it up there for a little while and it comes back down, that is letting your body know it is time to let go of cortisol, which is why exercise is a great antidote for stress. But your heart rate coming down is not letting go of the cortisol. It is a signal. Okay. That we need to do that, but it's not doing it. Okay. It's not right. It is allow. It's like, hello, hello body. It is time to let go of that cortisol. Okay. So that sort of feeling that you have after you've raised your heart rate up for a while and let it come down. Now, exercise isn't the only thing that can pump your, your heart rate up. Uh, if you're a sports fan, like I am a sports fan, and perhaps even if you're in your own living room, you're on your feet cheering on your, your team, your heart rate goes up, you sit down after hopefully they score, and you feel that sort of feeling, that's a signal to your body to let the cortisol out of your system. Okay. So if you have occupied, occupied yourself or had that contemplative time, you're raising your heart rate and letting it go back down. You have helped your system get rid of the cortisol. So if you can think of something to do before you go to bed, that is going to do that for you you'll have an easier time drifting off to sleep. Now, changing your breath is another signal. Anytime we can lengthen our breath and deepen it, that's a signal. That's why meditation works, but singing works and laughing works just as well. Laughing is a great idea. Yeah, yeah. A Mm -hmm. funny video. So yes, scrolling through Facebook may not be a great thing to do right before you go to bed, but controlled amount of funny video may be something that will help you. It's interesting you say that because one of the things I try to do is to watch some silly, stupid sitcom before bed. Yes. Okay. 30 minutes of a sitcom with interval laughs Mm -hmm. as opposed to a drama that you got to think. Right. Or worse, one that sort of keeps you occupied thinking about, you know, the end of the world or something. Oh, yeah. That's not helpful. (laughs) So it's interesting. So when the heart rate slows down, it's a sign to get rid of the cortisol. Mm -hmm. So how do we get rid of the cortisol? Your body is naturally designed to let it go. It just sometimes needs your help when you're living at that high alert, a high alert to signal that it's time. Um, So it'll do it. Hence the deep breathing, that type of thing. Right. Exactly. Okay. That's because I am so much like your husband in that aspect. Mm-hmm. And my late wife, she was more like you, fair skin, like sit under the umbrella, would read, whatever. And uh, it's definitely different. And I, I need to have some kind of activity. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's very different. So there is not a one size fits all for how to Absolutely. deal with this. Okay. And there are a lot of things that are sort of that busy hands, free mind mm-hmm. part, woodworking, sewing, those sort of things that you are busy doing something that requires a certain level of concentration and, and is occupying that allows you to not think about the other thing. And it's also where that creative brain is able to process things. And then all of a sudden you're like, I know what I should do because you've occupied the, the part of your brain that's 
thinking about the stress stuff and you let the mm-hmm. other parts. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because if I can share a story, I used to uh, produce events while in the mortgage mm-hmm. banking industry. So I would work Monday to Friday in the mortgage industry, very stressed out. Mm-hmm. And about six to 10 times a year, we would travel to produce an event. And we would leave on a, you know, a, a Friday afternoon, go down, work our tails off Saturday, Sunday, fly back, get home at midnight on Sunday night. I back up and I was energized on Monday morning. Right. Because the brain went in a different direction. Right. And it's another indication that we all have different reactions to the stressors in our environment. For okay. some people, the idea of going for a weekend and having to work on an event, it, that would be torture. But it's not for you. You're energized by that work. Well, I'm so, energized by it. And it took my brain in a different direction from more right. thinking. Right. Absolutely. So, so it's really embracing what works for you. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to work for me. It doesn't have to work for my husband. It has to work for you. So is this like a barometer and it gravitates across a line or is it you're all one way or all the other way? We all exist in my world, somewhere between border colony and iguana. And depending on what you need. And one of the things that I have in the book are suggested activities that would work if you were a border collie with iguana tendencies or you're an iguana with border collie tendencies or actually flat in the middle on, you know, you're an iguana collie, mm-hmm. wherever you are, okay. there are different things that are going to be better for you. And you may find you need this sort of activity now, but tomorrow you might need something a little different. It's mm-hmm. really about how do you disconnect from what's causing you stress? Okay. So that brings me to the question. I've heard it for years. Stress is not bad. It's how mm. we respond to stress. Yes. Is the problem. Can you kind of elaborate? Is, is stress a bad thing or not? It, it just is. It's not good or bad. It is a natural a reaction thing. to the what's in your environment. We have the same exact reaction as we do to the car coming on the on-ramp to a surprise birthday party. It's the same thing. Your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure. Like That's what makes life fun. If we didn't have that reaction, mm-hmm. why would we bother building roller coasters? Like, Right? That reaction is what yeah. gives life the zing. It's when we're at this high level of stress all the time, where your cortisol level just lives up there, that's the problem. Okay. In this crazy pandemic world we're in, Mm -hmm. in the workplace, Mm -hmm. there's so many people that are getting kind of stressed out. They've got this, they're on a Zoom meeting until two o'clock and they got another meeting. It starts at two o'clock and they just, they they haven't buffered in, you know, time in between. Mm -hmm. When they're on that, is there something that leaders can do or is there something people can do at work to try and get through that? And again, I, I want to try to look about it from the leadership side. What can, what can be done in the workplace in today's crazy world? I think there's two things that come to mind about that. Uh, well, actually three. First, acknowledging that it's a problem. And sometimes just looking at the environment that you're in and saying that is a lot. And there's a good reason I feel like I do helps, especially somebody else recognizing that you're doing the best you can in the environment you're in. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that oftentimes there are things as leaders that we don't know about what is going on in our workers' lives. And one of the things that I always find interesting is when I work with a company, I interview the leaders and we survey all of the, all of the employees to see what's causing stress in the environment. The, oftentimes the leaders have come to me saying, we have this problem. We have a work-life balance problem. We have a morale problem. We have this. And the employees tell a different story. Yep. 
So the lack of that data and that concept, oftentimes leaders are trying to solve the wrong problem. And oftentimes there are opportunities to solve a problem so simply that would mean so much to the employees, but the, the leaders don't know about it because either they haven't asked the right question or mm-hmm. because of the culture, they're not going to, the employees aren't going to share that information, but they will with a third party, uh, which is always interesting. So yeah. that matchup between what the leaders think is the problem and what the problem really is, really exposes some opportunities. Um, I was just talking to someone who said that they had identified a morale problem. They were trying to solve it with all kinds of different things, but then somebody finally did some third party party research and it turned out that it was in a kitchen. They just needed new saute pans. That is an easy to solve problem. And one of the insights in the book that I get from interviewing hundreds of leaders is that really effective leaders solve problems so their people can do the best work. Part of it is getting the data about what really are the problems. Mm -hmm. And then the other piece is making a firm commitment to solving those problems. The leader that I profile on this in the book is from Ford Financial Bank, which is a regional bank here in the Midwest. They wanted to be the bank of choice in the region, so they knew they had to be the employer of choice in the region. One of the things they recognize is that a lot of their people were one bad thing happening away from financial distress, Yeah. right? Um, $4,000 to fix your car or a medical bill was going to put them in serious financial distress. They're a bank. They figured out how to build the Ford fund. They match what the employees put into it. And there is a process that if you get the $4,000 medical bill that you can't pay, you can apply for a grant and have it paid. There is a level of comfort knowing my employer has my back. Yep. That will, that goes a long way to make people, making employees feel seen and valued. Mm -hmm. And when employees see, feel seen and valued and connected to the mission of the organization, they will walk through fire. Fire, yeah. So let's let's take this a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. There are some people who are working and their bosses are the main stress problem. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's putting it mildly. Um, Yep. They're not giving them breaks. They're not doing things. Mm-hmm. Work hard. Keep going. And there's in, in parts of the country, this is just a mentality mindset. Mm-hmm. And they're pushing people so hard that people are stressing out. So what besides just up and leaving, because let's face it, jobs right. are hard right now. And there are you know, the great resignation, or as uh, we talked the other week in a podcast, the great reshuffle is mm-hmm. going on. But when you stop to think, What can a person do if they feel that they're being so pushed and stressed because of work? Yeah, that is tough because there are a lot of people who are not in the position to leave Mm -hmm. or they feel so committed. I have been in this so committed to the organization or to the clients that they serve that they are not willing to leave the position because they feel that's important. So they get constantly pushed down by somebody who is not recognizing their efforts. You're right. It causes a significant amount of of stress. And one of the things that I talk about in the book is really reevaluating the benefit of that experience because we can absolutely narrow our perception of our job to the numbers on a check and the benefits described in our annual report. But there are more than just those benefits to the job. There's lots of ancillary and and, um, really important benefits. Mm -hmm. For example, if you really enjoy the people that you work with, maybe your boss stinks, but you love your team, 
that's a benefit. There is a camaraderie and a, a joy in working together as a team, yep. even if your boss stinks. Mm-hmm. Remembering that you really love your team increases. So I'm not going to say it's going to make it all rosy, but it helps. Right. So at that point, if we take our mindset to say, I love my team, mm-hmm. and while the boss is being a stressor over here, if mm-hmm. you go to the point of loving my team, that can help release the cortisol. Right. It is reframing. We all do a cost benefit analysis yep. in our brain all the time. Like, is this no worth Franklin my Club. time and effort? Yep. Right. Exactly. So when you're looking at it and you're like, my boss stinks, my job sucks, this isn't worth my time. If you can bring that cost down a little bit and the benefit up by saying, I love the people that I work with. They're some of uh, my favorite people in the world. I love the work that I do. Sometimes Mm -hmm. that is fulfilling in itself. I'm excited about this project. I really value being able to help my clients do X, Y, or Z. Really delving into those benefits and even what those numbers on the paycheck allow you to have in your life. Focusing on those benefits evens it out a little bit and it becomes less stressful. I am not saying it's going to make it the best workplace in the world. It's more palatable. Right. Exactly. And and then you practice those getting, you know, disconnecting from that stressor when your boss isn't present. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Now, companies... I'm sure because you've been in the field for so long. A lot of places they're going to bring in somebody and they're going to do a, we're going to do a stress management program mm-hmm. or we'll have a stress management workshop mm-hmm. or something of that nature. We know that stress is a problem. We, we're having to do more with less. So the companies realize that people are stressed. Right. Why do most of them fail? Most of them fail because they don't have the data. They're not solving the right problem. They're checking a box like, ooh, mm-hmm. we know our people are stressed. Check, we did a stress management problem or pro- project. Cool. Mm-hmm. But unless you are actually addressing what is causing stress in the, ev- in the environment, it's just an hour that you spent, hopefully yeah. well entertained. And yeah. maybe you walked away with something, but it's not going to solve the problem. No. It's like um, when a child comes home and has a fever, you give them a Tylenol or something to take care of the fever, but that's not taking care of the problem. Right, right. Do they actually need antibiotics? If you need antibiotics, the Tylenol doesn't do a darn thing. Right, right. And that's kind of key that we start to recognize that. Mm -hmm. So are there there questions that our listeners can take right now uh, in, in a leadership role? Are there questions that they can start asking people, three, four, five questions that can help them find those problems? So I'm always happy to work with somebody to develop a survey um, mm-hmm. on what's causing stress in the environment. The, the thing that I will say is I have to jump through hoops quite a bit to convince people often that this survey is anonymous because they don't want to be able to make a comment or say, well, my boss is my top stressor. If they think that that comment is going to get back and yeah. be pointed at them. Oh yeah, yeah. Anonymity is absolutely essential. Yeah, and getting yes. them to believe it is a challenge. Right. So that third party, if you really want to know what's going on in your organization, get a third party to find out. That would be my advice. Okay. But if you just are doing a check-in. Asking people uh, about, you know, even, even if it's just, how are we doing? You know, on a typical week, how often are you stressed? Are you hardly ever stressed? Some of the time, most of the time, all the time? Just getting a gauge is helpful. Okay. Um, asking questions like open-ended. I'm a big fan of an open-ended question. Mm -hmm. If this company could solve one thing at work to make your job easier, what would it be? Okay. Who knows? Sometimes it's saute pans. 
or making sure there's toilet paper in the, in the bathroom when you actually get to take a break. Whatever it is, there may be something that is just bugging people that you don't know about that you could solve in a snap. Yeah. And that's, is that a question you would ask globally to everybody on a team? Or would that be something you might ask in a one-on-one or possibly both ways? I would, I would do it both ways. Um, okay. I think that sort of anonymous feedback is sometimes helpful because it'll allow people to be more honest um, yeah. about Bob's, it. Uh, if Bob's there in the survey, what, what, what could we do? Fire Susan. Yeah, you don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not going to say fire Susan in the meeting. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, that's key. So give us a few things that let's take it from the senior level office. Okay. And then let's talk about it in more of a mid-level area that leaders can do, you know, because to help relieve the stress, to help people perform well under stress. So there are certain things that executives can do and there's certain things that right. managers can do and frontline people can do. So is, do you have something there? I do. And as basic as it sounds, it's very, very important. People like to be told that they are doing a good job. And as, as simple as it sounds, we don't do it enough. Mm-hmm. And we wait until, you know, a project is all the way to to completion before we say, hey, good job on that. We don't celebrate the effort along the way. And how good would it be if your superior came by your cubicle or just walking you know, past you or you're on a Zoom call, however you're, you're meeting right now and said, hey, Greg, you know, I know this project is really hard. I appreciate all of your work on it. How much does that make a difference in just saying, oh, my benefit just went up in that I'm working really hard and that cost is high, but my benefit went up because somebody saw what I was doing and appreciated it. Yeah. High performance people need to be valued and seen. And it's so interesting because 30 years ago, that was unheard of. Mm-hmm. My father, when he was in business, he, was, he owned his own company. He would simply say, I'm not going to kiss somebody's butt just to get to the job they were hired to do in the first place. Sit down, shut right. up, and work. Right. Okay? And it was an old, it was an old mindset. Mm-hmm. So that's changed. We need to understand that, that people are reacting, excuse me, people are responding better to positive reinforcement where they might react to negative enforcement. And let me be clear, this is not everybody gets a trophy. No, not at all. Right? This is recognizing effort along the way. Mm -hmm. And um, I just finished reading No Matter What by Sam Silverstein, which if you haven't had him on your podcast, you should. You know, I haven't talked to Sam in years. That's a good point. Yeah, he's great. But um, he was pointing out that people need to be encouraged and celebrated in the way they would like to be encouraged and celebrated. And that is, again, not a one size fits all Mm -hmm. opportunity. Some people like to be called up in front of the class and said, look at what she did. Other people, that's horribly embarrassing. (laughs) So knowing your people Mm -hmm. well enough to say, I know that just having a quiet word with this person and saying, I appreciate what you're doing, or I appreciated your input in the meeting today. I appreciated that you worked more hours on this than probably we anticipated, and I really appreciate you. And other people really need to have the yay at the staff meeting. Mm-hmm. Knowing your people makes a difference. Absolutely. And that goes back now in taking a different assessment, whether it's Myers-Briggs or DISC mm-hmm. or some of those profiles can really help leaders grasp that handle on how to work with different people. Absolutely true. Yeah. So, so with the pandemic and we're mm-hmm. coming up on that time where that 
quite frankly, when the, the whole thing started in March of 2020, we thought might last six or eight weeks. We're now coming up on 104 weeks. Um, oh my gosh, I hadn't added it up like that. Yikes. <laughs> yeah, coming up on two years. So there's pressures from so many different directions today. Mm-hmm. Do more with less. All these things we've already talked about. What are some of the pressures right now that you're starting to see in, in the workplace? How are people handling it and things of that nature? I really see a lot of uncertainty fatigue. Uncertainty is different like than pretty much all other stressors. Like that car coming on the on-ramp, once that car has cleared, the stressor is gone. Mm-hmm. Uncertainty never leaves never leaves. It's the the stuff that's in your brain, keeping you awake at night. We have been dealing with that for so long and we think, Oh, it's gonna, Nope, it's not. (laughs) It's just this constant, constant uncertainty. Keep seeing light at the end of the tunnel, but it's right. It's it's a train coming at us again. Right. Right. Um, And you're like, Oh, could we just get out of this? And Mm -hmm. we're, uh, particularly when there's been plans that we're all going to come back to the office on February 1st. Uh, just kidding. Uh, let's look at May, uh, March 15th or whatever. I've had a couple of my clients do that and they've yeah. had to push it four times now. But yeah. And it's, it's wearing. Mm-hmm. And again, the recognition that it's hard is helpful and appreciated but there has to be a break and we all need a break from the uncertainty and whether that's actually separating yourself physically from work and doing something else, going on vacation, taking a trip, not all of us are, have that ability. Sometimes it's just doing something that you can see all the way through, you know, all the steps and you can have that feeling of completion and certainty will make you feel better. Anything, when things feel uncertain, if you can put something in order, it makes you feel better. Mm -hmm. It is why we all cleaned out our garages and our attics and our messy second rooms when the pandemic started, because putting things in order when there's chaos in the world feels good. Mm -hmm. So finding, you know, even if it's a puzzle, if you're a puzzle co- completer, something that you can do, put in order and see a completion feels better. Yeah. It gives you that break from the uncertainty. 21 years ago, mm-hmm. ish, you're lying in a hospital room, mm-hmm. expecting twins, mm-hmm. and you have a massive heart attack. Yep. That's that's a blatant, excuse the expression, kick in the butt. Oh, for sure. There are lots of other things that can be signs that are not quite as blatant. Right. So if we're not releasing our cortisols, if we're not taking these de-stressors, if we're not doing our deep breathing, whatever mm-hmm. it is for us, if, whether you're the border collie or the iguana, if we're, what are some of those other signs that we should watch for both in ourselves, our coworkers, Mm -hmm. our children, our spouses, our parents, whoever. It's really noticing the signs within ourselves and others in terms of recognizing that our response, both emotionally and physically to uncertainty and overwhelm are natural. And it doesn't really matter what it is. It's okay. So oftentimes we, we say to ourselves, well, I shouldn't feel this way about this. You know, why am I so angry all the time? I shouldn't be so angry. Mm -hmm. Well, when you're dealing with constantly recalculating what you need to do, because the world is uncertain, that produces anger. Mm -hmm. That is a, that's okay. Natural reaction sitting in the anger is not healthy. Right. So recognizing I am angry, maybe I am not actually angry at the spectrum person who answered the phone. Maybe that's not who I'm angry at. I'm mm-hmm. angry at this chaotic world. 
I need to do something, that is a sign. So how do anytime- we find how do we find what we need to do? Is there are there techniques that that can work? I mean, some people say I need a break. I need to go to the beach or whatever. Right, right. So it is a not a single thing. It is a whole collection of skills that you can gain to be able to function well, live well, enjoy your life, work work well under stress you can't avoid. Because honestly, there's all kinds of things that we're not able to just shove out of our lives. We can't do anything about the pandemic. We often have a boss we can't control. Whatever it is, Those are stressors that we have no control over. We need to find ways to keep them from causing us emotional and physical harm. Mm -hmm. And so the things that we've already talked about, disconnecting from the source of stress, telling your body to let go of the cortisol, giving yourself a break from the uncertainty, and really recognizing that what you're feeling is okay that it's a sign that you're stressed and then actively doing things to cope with that are pieces of the puzzle. It's not an easy solution where I'm like, I can fix that in one 40 minute conversation, Greg. It's, it's, a, it's a larger piece. Yeah. But in the book that I wrote is really the collection of all of the things that I have used for 21 years for myself. Okay. And with, people around the country to do just that live and work well under the stress they can't avoid because as a heart attack survivor with a repaired heart, I cannot afford the amount of risk that high stress puts on me in terms of my heart health. Yeah. It's amazing. I was talking to a uh, cardiologist, I don't know, probably three or four years ago Mm -hmm. and so many people after having a heart attack still do not change their lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And that's just scary at that point. So they're just continuing to have the cortisols and all right. the stressors build back up in them. So. so that's something I know from my own experience that we very rarely make any sort of change based on information. So I was 35 when I had a heart attack you would have thought that that would have turned me into the biggest workout queen in the world because I was told that I needed to do 20 minutes of cardiovascular exercise every day to make everything heal and make sure that I was okay. I knew I had the information, but I wasn't doing it because I had not connected it to something that I wanted. And it wasn't until my husband sat me down and called me out for not doing the work that I really recognized Mm -hmm. that it wasn't about getting on the stupid bike and doing 20 minutes. It was about the fact that I really wanted to be a mom to our children. And I wasn't going to get that opportunity if I didn't do the work to make sure that I was healthy enough to be there. So so, I'm going to say, I'm going to go ahead and use one of my quotes. All you right. Had, you had the knowledge mm-hmm. of what you needed to do. You had not applied it. I had not applied it. And I had not figured out how mm-hmm. to connect it to something I wanted so that I was willing to do it. So my quote is, knowledge is not power without application. Yeah, absolutely. And so we've got to start applying what we know. Mm-hmm. Um, we could go on for another hour here. There's no (laughs) doubt about that. Um, I mean, I've I've sat through people over the years and and we talked beforehand about Zig Ziglar Mm -hmm. and, you know, Zig was just a master at getting people to move in certain directions and uh, understanding the strength of that and how he motivated people. And he actually did a study one time where people came in at the end of a day and they took the blood samples and measured the cortisol levels and all the Mm -hmm. uh, units three hours after his seminar, they were stronger and better Mm -hmm. three hours later at the end of the day, because they were putting the right information into their brain. And when we do that and we find our ways to relax, we can, we can do so much more. So your name of your book again is 
Stress Proof Your Life. And that can be picked up, I'm assuming, on Amazon or millions Absolutely. of other places. Okay. Uh, Eliz, it's been a pleasure to have you on board here. I'd love to bring you back again and have another chat down the road. Um, guys, and, hey, people want to reach out to you. What's the best way for them to find you? You could find me at my website. It, it has a lot of E's. It's my name, Eliz Green, E-L-I-Z-G-R-E-E-N-E, as I said, lots of E's, dot com. You're as bad as I am with the G's. <laughs> right. <laughs> I feel you. I, we're kindred spirits here. <laughs> Absolutely. So it's been a privilege to have you on board with the Teamwork Advantage. And uh, folks, again, reach out to Eliz. She's got ideas that can probably help you individually. And if nothing else, maybe get your teams on the right track so that the teams are more productive, the leadership is better, and your culture is improved. So thanks again, Eliz, for joining us here. Um, you know, folks, once a week with the Teamwork Advantage, you get ideas that you can use immediately. And whether you are a border collie or an iguana, Liz has talked today about things that you can absolutely do to improve your life, improve your health, to get along and become more productive. Until next week, remember, having a good day is just being average. When you listen to the Teamwork Advantage, we know you're not average. So go make today excellent and exceptional. Take care. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Teamwork Advantage with Greg Gregory. Be sure to like, subscribe, and activate the bell icon to be notified of future episodes. To learn more about how Greg can help your organization develop a powerful winning culture, visit TeamsRock.com. That's TeamsRock.com.